On Home Factory, we get you in the mood by lighting up these tea light candles. And then we get boozy at bath time with a luxurious salt scrub. And we sit back and get cozy with this comfy couch. But first, we think pink with these queens of kitsch. Here's a fun fact. There are more lawn flamingos in North America than real flamingos, you know. Which is probably a good thing because plastic flamingos are a lot more fun. Invented in 1957 by Don Featherstone, these lawn ornaments have withstood the test of both time and taste. <laughs> So we're off to Cato and Union Products Manufacturing Facility in Fitchburg, Massachusetts to ask, well, why? This is Bruce and Claude, President and Vice President of Cato and Union Products. Okay, Bruce, Claude, why? It's lawn art. <laughs> Some people say it's tacky, but people well, love it. Well, someone said bad taste never goes out of style, That's I think right. it was. The life of the pink flamingo begins on this factory floor, where 454 kilograms of high-density polyethylene pellets, or good old-fashioned plastic, are measured into a box. In one year, 250,000 kilograms of plastic will be transformed into flamingos. The pellets are forklifted over to Darwin, who is raring to go. Let's do it. Once the plastic has been measured, Darwin adds 4.5 kilograms of plastic pink pellets because, well, in the flamingo industry, you have to think pink. Right, guys? Think pink all the time. The plastic mix is fed into a hopper. The pellets are heated to 175 degrees Celsius and melted to a soft, thick consistency. 800 grams of melted plastic is extruded and lowered down into this flamingo mold. The pink mix fills the entire mold. As the mold closes, cold air blows through it, forcing the melted plastic against the sides of the mold, cooling it, and leaving a hollow shape in the center. Each mold makes two flamingos. So how many are we talking each day? Well, in broad strokes, we can make approximately a, a thousand pair a day. The air is sucked out and the flamingos are released. Into the arms of this flamingo fan named Gustavo. Gustavo drills eye holes into the flamingos. Then he breaks the flamingos out of their molds. The excess plastic is gathered and recycled for the next batch of flamingos in this machine called Godzilla. Oh! The flamingos are passed on to Maria. Maria loves a flamingo. Hi! She's wearing pink. You like it, my color? Love it. <laughs> Maria adds two beady eyes to each of the birds. I bet her house is floor-to-ceiling flamingos. I don't have a house. I live in the third floor. I can put a flamingo. Oh, right. Uh, sorry, Maria. Probably about time we moved along anyway. We're ready to blowtorch the birds. No! Yes! This is Tom. Introduce yourself, Tom. Hi, I'm Tom. And what will you be doing today? Today I'll be flaming flamingos. Have you ever gone too far and fried the flamingo? Yeah. Oh, I can't watch. I won't watch. All right, let's make this quick. The beak is blowtorched to remove the surface oil from the plastic, which prepares it for painting. But to avoid viewer distress, we asked Tom to record a special disclaimer as reassurance of our flamingo-friendly policies. No flamingos were hurt during the making of this TV show. Thanks, Tom. That should keep our lawyers happy. The birds are passed along to the painting department, where their beaks are spray-painted a cheerful yellow by Anna. And then outlined in black by Stella. We also do nails. Nails! Okay. Once painted, the birds are put onto a conveyor and run through a drying tunnel. As they exit, the flamingos are hand-boxed in pairs, together with four spindly legs. Two for each bird. Well, the mold was designed in pairs, and it gives you a, two different styles. You have a standing unit, and you have a feeding unit. So, it gives you a nice little look. 
Sure, but why stop at two? There must be fun to be had with a whole bunch of flamingos. It's actually something called flocking. It's usually done in the dead of night. Some people raise money, some organizations raise money, where people will actually put 12 dozen on someone's lawn, and they have to pay something to get them off the lawn. Yep, they're kind of popping up all over the place. Hey, I wonder if there's any truth to the rumor that flamingos will replace the turkey as the Thanksgiving bird of choice. Just kidding, flamingos. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, question for you. What's romantic, cheap, and actually pretty easy? Oh no, I feel an insult coming on. No, tea lights! I was thinking tea lights. Oh, okay. Well, we have a lot of those thanks to Neo Image Candlelights. And this is their 60,000 square foot facility in Mississauga, Ontario. And this is Gary and Kirk Stratakos, cousins and managing directors. They're gonna tell us what makes these tea light candles so hot. They're made in Canada. They're great quality. And uh, they're our products, our family's products. But which cousin is the boss? <laughs> Sorry, I can't help <laughs> See how I'm laughing? Well, whoever's running the show, it's a pretty impressive operation. In a year, we manufacture enough tea lights that if you line them up next to each other, you can make a continuous line from New York City to LA. Tea light production begins with liquid paraffin wax. That arrives in 20,000 kilogram batches on these trucks. The wax is delivered at a temperature of around 80 degrees Celsius and is held in these 40,000 kilogram storage silos until it's ready to be brought out onto the production floor. From the holding silos, the wax is transferred to this machine called a granulator, which sprays the hot liquid wax against a cold metal cylinder. And this is where the magic happens. As the hot wax hits the cold metal, it hardens instantly to form crystals or granules. The cylinder rotates, dropping the wax granules in trays below. So a candle is made instantly rather than taking a liquid wax, pouring it, and allowing it to dry over time. Smart. Trays of the granulated wax are emptied onto moving agitators and transferred to these barrels. The constant motion means the wax won't clump and helps cool the granules before they hit the presses. The central vacuum system transports the wax into a pipe up to the ceiling, across the factory, to the presses. Here to talk us through the tea light assembly process is Nestor. They call him the tea light master. I am the tea light master. Uh, one thing, we're gonna need you on the ground floor. Can we send him back down, please? Perfect. Well, as any tea light master could tell you, the first stage is understanding the parts. So a tea light is formed from aluminum cup, it's a candle itself, it's a wick, and a sustainer. So, just four parts, but equally important. The granulated wax is deposited in the hoppers, which feed these rotating tables, each with tea light shaped molds or cavities. As the tables rotate, the molds are filled and pistons drop to compress the wax into 13 gram circular tea lights. The spike in the center of each mold pierces the tea light to accommodate the wick. Ah, the wick. That's prepared separately on this wick waxer. A machine which is overseen by Steve, who is also a relative. Here he is pondering the eternal question, how long is a piece of string? And he's found the answer. It's four kilometers long. For those doing the math, a four kilometer length of wick arrives on a two kilogram spool. The spool unwinds it into this hot wax bath, then emerges coated and is re-spooled on the other side. That waxed wick is then sent back to the presses via this impressive automated system. Okay. The molded candles are filtered down from the presses. Then the wax wick is fed into the machine through the candles and clamped in place with a sustainer. This rotating device then punches a sustainer into each tea light. The aluminum cups are dumped into this central vat, which then orients them ready to receive the candles. The tea lights are individually pushed into their respective aluminum casings. 
the assembled tea lights are spat back out onto the production line. Organized into lanes and sent to the packaging department. Where they're counted by this cool photo light sensor. Batching 100 tea lights at a time, then wrapping a plastic sheet around them to form a bag. With 100 tea lights in each bag, how many does that make in a day? Million. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. And how many to create a romantic ambiance? I don't need any. <laughs> well, that's good, because these tiny tea lights are boxed, sealed, and sent to storage. To be delivered to Casanovas across the country. Uh, why? Did their lights go out? Five hours of romantic flickering candlelight sounds like a perfect... What? I don't get it. Date night. Right. Oops. Okay, so vodka plus lime plus salt plus mango butter makes... Breakfast of champions? Well, yes, but also this. Lush's Ocean Salt Self-Preserving Scrub. A cosmetic cocktail with a kick. So we're going to Lush's 120,000 square foot Toronto facility to meet Sarah Ponte. Sarah's going to explain exactly how they make a self-preserving scrub. Self-preserving at Lush means that we're using natural ingredients to preserve our products naturally. By doing this, we're able to eliminate the use of synthetic preservatives. If you can use a product that has no synthetics in it, and you have the option to use something that's natural, why wouldn't you use it? Try just describing it in three words. The three words that I would use to describe self-preserving ocean salt would be fresh, gentle, and rejuvenating. Great, now tell us about the vodka. The night before, we're going to make an extract of lime and vodka. Done. Done here, in fact, in Lush's cosmetic kitchen, where Sarah and senior compounder Huang start making the magic. First up, Huang and Sarah roughly chop the limes, leaving the rinds intact because they're packed full of vitamin C. Vitamin C brightens my skin and minimizes the appearance of my wrinkles. The limes are blended with vodka. The alcohol content is going to help preserve this scrub, then it's left to soak overnight. In a year, we've gone through about the same equivalent of 32 vodka martinis. Actually, we heard it was more like 32,000. Oh, did I say only 32? That's a sad party. <sighs> Chopped grapefruit is wrapped in cheesecloth, which is left to infuse in a pot of water, simmering at 94 degrees Celsius. Once cooked and cooled, the grapefruit infusion is poured into this steam kettle. Then, organic coconut oil, organic mango butter, and avocado butter are added. All very moisturizing, I'm sure, but this looks more like something I put in my mouth than on my body. Waxes are added, which will warm on the skin to create a spreadable finish. Then Huang blends chopped tofu with glycerin. Tofu is known to contain nutrients, which tighten and moisturize the skin. Okay, but seriously, could you actually eat this stuff? If you really wanted to, you could. I'd rather just drink the vodka lime extracts. The lime vodka extract is blended by this giant hand mixer. Then it's strained to catch any pulp. Then it's transferred to a mixer. The final ingredient is a top-secret mix of essential oils, which get blended together at Lush's UK headquarters. After cooling overnight, this blend is ready for some seasoning. Fine sea salt is measured in very, very carefully. Careful now, Sarah. Careful. The salt is the stuff that's going to really buff the skin. It's been used as a natural exfoliant for centuries. Approximately this year, we've used 38 tons of salt, which is about the same weight as 17 great white sharks. We love sharks at Lush. We love sharks, too. Now it's over to our packagers, Bethany, Tim, and Lori. And that's the ocean waves they're miming, just in case it wasn't immediately obvious. The scrub is transferred to this tap-operated depositor, where Bethany measures it into 250-gram pots. By the end of the day, I can actually hear the ocean. Yeah, well, she's not the only one. Lori dips each pot in a little extra fine sea salt, which has been dyed to a soothing blue color. 
Then the pots are passed to Tim, who adds a lid. They've slowed down for us, but this gang can package up to 20,000 pots a day. In one year, Lush produces over 107,000 kilograms of ocean salt scrub. The pots are crated and transferred to this machine for labeling. Lids are labeled first. Then each pot receives an iconic Lush label and a face sticker. Every product that leaves the factory has a sticker with a face of the compounder who made it. When the customers purchase the products, they can actually see who mixed it all up and made it for them. And this is a huge thing for a compounder to actually finally get. Labeled pots are loaded into packing cartons to await distribution to bathrooms across the country. Whoa, how decadent. A salty scrub with a boozy kick sure makes bath time sound a lot more appealing. Is it weird that I still want to eat this stuff? Yeah, say some for the skin, would you? You know, some would call this a couch. While others might simply say sofa. But here on Home Factory, it's called Evelyn. Yep. And Evelyn's made here at Statum Design's 110,000 square foot facility in North York, Ontario. This is Angelo Gallo. As president of the company, he just loves his Statum Designed couches. There's no need of saying I'm president of the company. Modest. Evelyn's construction begins here on this 44 yard long cutting table with Tyroon. A 50 yard roll of polyester fabric is rolled out. Then a sofa pattern, drawn to scale on perforated paper, is rolled out on top. Tyrone traces the pattern using a white powdery chuck. When the paper is rolled away, that pattern is visible on the fabric, ready for Tyrone to start the cutting process using this tool. Yeah, that's a rotary blade, and it's used because it can cut fabric on a curve. The Evelyn sofa is comprised of about 27 pieces to make all the covers, cushions, and trim. Those 27 pieces are gathered up and sent to the machinists, who have all lined up to give us a nice, friendly hello. Well, most of them. Must be on a break. The first stage of the sewing is the body of the frame, and that's done by Harprinder. She's basically turning a two-dimensional design into a three-dimensional piece. And she's also adding polysynthetic liner to prevent the cover from sticking to the foam. But to a sewing professional like Harprinder, that's no biggie. I know my stuff. <laughs> Next up, seat cushions, sewn by Yuna. And Yuna shows us how it's done. They put the foam inside and put it on the seat. So you have a beautiful cushion to sit on. <laughs> For our weary home factory butts? Yes. <laughs> the seat cushion covers are filled with a flexible foam using this neat vise, which compresses and releases it into the cover, letting it fill the space, creating a soft, sturdy cushion. It's one of the most comfortable sofa you can sit on. It's the perfect sofa for the average consumer and the younger generation. Then the back cushions are filled with a hollow fill polyester using this blower. Adding air to the fill makes the fiber operate like a spring, and more springiness means maximum comfort. It's all about comfort. With the cushions and covers all sewn up, it's time to tackle the frame. This is Sylvester. He's tacking plastic fasteners onto a pre-built wooden frame. 8.5 gauge springs are clipped onto the fasteners, stretched across the seat area, and hammered into place. See if you don't know spring, you're sitting on the ground. You must have spring in it to sit on. Yeah. That guy blows my mind. With the fabric sewn, the frame built, and the springs added, the final stage is to put the pieces together. And that would be the job of Andreas. Andreas covers the arms in foam and then the body of the sofa, stapling and trimming as he goes. 
This is a process which takes several hours, but we've asked Andreas to do it at 10 times the normal speed because while well, watching someone do all that work can be pretty exhausting. Is it nap time yet? No. Studs are hammered into the legs. And a fabric liner is added to the bottom to protect against dust. Now I really need a break. Okay, go ahead, Andreas. You're all done, buddy. <laughs> The finishing touches are added using this cardboard stencil and chalk. The outline is embossed with stitching, and a pre-cut leather panel is fitted into place. Hand-hammered metal studs add the final embellishment. And Evelyn's done. Wrapped in plastic, ready to be shipped to anyone who likes sitting on a couch. We all go home, and after you have a good dinner, where do you go? You go and sit on a couch. Sit, sure. Or, you know, maybe even sit and invite some friends over. Yeah, that too. Curl up, lie down, bounce around. Yep, all these things, very possible. That kind of makes me want to go home. Don't let me hold you back. Seriously, can we go now?